Good morning and welcome to worship at Manasquan Presbyterian Church. Um, I, I'm noticing that some of you, especially the Thompson family, you're, you're not um, uh, adhering to the six feet of distance and social distancing. So, um, well, God has called and gathered us here uh, today in, in this uh, very unique time in uh, our history. It's unprecedented. So uh, we have chosen to continue with worship services uh, uh, for today, keep, um, uh, keep an eye on your email and different things like that. Things change moment to moment uh, on that as we are looking at uh, uh, stopping the spread of the coronavirus. Um, so uh, I, I have made a decision that we're going to just not have any um, events in the church during this week. Um, we'll probably still have our food pantry open, but have an entry where you just come in and use the elevator, go down, and then we just continually sanitize that for, uh, for those who are uh, the families in the food pantry. So uh, be, be looking for that. Um, on Saturday, uh, we got notice that Jackson School in Florida is discontinuing uh, classes on site for the rest of the year. He graduates in May, so it's kind of sad for him. And then we got the notice that he needs to be out of his apartment, and he's home on spring break. He was supposed to go back today. Uh, so Jackson and I get to do a road trip uh, either starting this afternoon or tomorrow, drive down to Florida to get him moved out. So I'll be away um, uh, and out of town this week. Pastor David will be here. Um, he'll be here at the hospital, but you can't go see him at the hospital uh, either. Uh, but he'll be here and available, and, and uh, Dave Valenta is here and, and other people. So. Um, in your bulletin, I, uh, we just put a little thing on here, just uh, some information. There's a lot of information. It's, a lot of this is what you already know, uh, but take time to read through this on you know, coronavirus in the church. And today during our offering, we're not going to be passing the plates around. You might have seen the offering plates out there. So as you leave, you can just uh, drop your um, offering in, in the offering plate um, as, as you go out. Um, and then we also put together this uh, different ways that you can give. We do have some self-addressed self -addressed envelopes at the Welcome Center. Uh, so if, you, if that is more convenient for you uh, to grab some of those and, uh, in your giving if you're not able to get to church. If you're sick, stay home, obviously. And um, uh, find ways that uh, we can not react by fear or, or, or to... Uh, you know, just go into the self-protection mode or go into an isolation mode, but how can we do the things that are listed in, in, in here in, in a way of, of understanding and helping uh, the most vulnerable among us as, as we're into this? So um, it is very uh, an, an interesting time. So uh, I'd like to invite Pastor David to come. He's going to share a few things of what's happening at the hospital and, and some other information for you. We have a tent set up, uh, a concert hut type uh, temporary structure on the first floor of the parking garage. And so people who come in will be tested uh, for coronavirus before they get into the hospital to, to keep it out of the, the main building. So, and then they'll be triaged and either sent home with, with instructions and so forth or brought in if they're uh, in extremis. Uh, we have what we call negative pressure rooms that we have for coronavirus sufferers, which means when you open the door of a typical room, the air in the room flows out. But we have negative pressure rooms so that when you open the door, um, the, the air doesn't flow out, air flows in. So it, 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 it's, a, it's a great way of, of even bumping up the, the precautions and protection even more. So 
we do have somebody with a case of, of we do have a patient at Jersey Shore or two, um, but we have them in those isolated in those rooms, and at they're they're at the end of the hallway, the far end, I might add. So I'm getting my steps in, um, but the, even the visitation to those rooms is limited to people who have to be in there. So, uh, um, do you have any questions about what's happening? So, um, if you need to come to the emergency room and you have something else wrong, you need not be afraid to come to the emergency room because you're going to be surrounded by a bunch of people who may have have. COVID-19, is that understandable? All right, so we're, we're keeping that out of the main building and working on it there. So the next thing I wanna say is that I brought some seeds that I want us to continue. I brought some paper goods and some cleaning supplies because I want us to be different. This is a time for Christians to celebrate community. And instead of hoarding, and going and wiping out the shelves so that we have enough and who cares about anybody else, I would love for our church to come and bring the very supplies that people need so that people who don't have them can have some. So I'm starting with good old Mr. Clean and uh, some Kleenex and uh, you know that other paper good that everybody wants. So uh, <laughs> let's be different. Let's be salt and light. Let's bring the very supplies that people are after so that the folks who come to the food pantry, for example, who can't get there can, can have some of the needed supplies, okay? Let's be salt and light. Let's, let's really demonstrate to the world what Christian community looks like. Thanks. David? Yes? Are you saying bring it to the pantry then, whatever we do? Yeah, when you, when, you, when you come maybe on Sunday or whatever, just drop it off and somebody will get it, okay? We're minimizing how many people are coming in and out of the building, but I think there'll be a way to bring stuff because there'll be an in and out to the pantry, okay? Yeah. Okay. All right, so. Thank you, for, thank you for your attention, and, and it's a part of life, and church is not something divorced and separate from life. It's, it's involved with life, so even though it's a, an untraditional start, let's now focus our hearts and our minds on the Lord and listen to our prelude.
Let us stand for a call to worship. Uh, the Psalms are a prayer book of the church, and one of the Psalms that has been um, circulating a lot during this last time is, is Psalm 91. It's a good Psalm to uh, uh, go back to and pray through uh, during this time and, and just rest in, in God's refuge. Um, our call to worship this morning is going to be the first four verses of the Psalm. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers. Under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. Now come, let us worship our God. Our opening song this morning is In the Cross of Christ I Glory. Let us come before God and offer our prayer of confession and receive God's grace and forgiveness in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me? Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Hear the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In him we are forgiven. Hallelujah. Amen. I invite you to be seated. As I said, we're going to uh, take the offering at the plates at the exits of the doors, and so we're not going to pass the plates around, but uh, I just invite you during this time of the offertory to think of the blessings that God has given each and every one of us, and how we in turn, as Pastor David had said, can and take our blessings and, and, and share them uh, with others as well, too.
Our Heavenly Father, we uh, come to you in prayer at this time. We thank you for the things that you have given to us, and, and we uh, pray for your guidance and your protection on uh, those things that threaten us. So be with us now, and um, uh, as we uh, reflect on the blessings that we have, and as we give back to you, we, we just pray that you take these gifts and, and use them for the furthering of your kingdom, uh, for the sharing of our brothers and sisters, for um, uh, the spreading of the gospel of your love and grace through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Um, before Pastor David uh, brings us the word this morning, I just wanted to share one other thing with you. Um, we are uh, in, in the midst of looking at how we can do live broadcasts of worship services and maybe even Bible studies and different things like that as we have some of the growth groups that are, are canceled. Um, so today what we have done is we're videotaping all three of our services. Right, Todd? We got these on videotape right there. Hello. Um, and uh, we will um, make these available immediately following the services. Uh, we're going to send an e-blast out to the entire congregation with all three services from today. So those who couldn't make it today will receive that. And all you do is click on a link. And it'll be there. And it's also on our church webpage. And we'll have that. And we're hoping by, by uh, within the next uh, uh, future that we will be able to have live broadcasts uh, on this. So if you uh, do find that you have to be at home, you can go to our website and click onto that very simply and see the live broadcast of the worship service. We're trying to do everything that we can to uh, continue to be the, the, the light to the world and, and to you, the congregation, so we can take that out. Now I invite us to uh, just come before and center around God's word as Pastor David brings us a message. So I'm on video? If you send me $59.95, I'll send you this special blessed prayer cloth that will heal all your diseases and solve all your problems. Say hallelujah. Say amen. Yes. I got to slick my hair back, though, if I'm going to be a TV evangelist. Don't tell Joanne I did that, okay? She just shakes her head and rolls her eyes and sighs. So, uh, I planned this before coronavirus, but it turns out to be pretty apropos. I want to talk to you today about risky business, but what I really mean is risky faith that comes from obedience. So, how are things going these days? How are your investments? Are you afraid to look? My, my 401k is down to about 298. Um, we're all uh, feeling a little shaky. I mean, I, I've worked at the hospital, I'm in my 27th year of working there, and on Friday, there were no people. There were no visitors. It was eerie, it was empty, it was quiet. Kate, come on, huh? It was just really strange. I, I, you think you, you know, after that many years of working in the same place, you kind of have your feet on solid ground and then all of a sudden there's nobody. And I'm thinking, should I go around to different rooms? That's what I do, but does it make, is it good sense to go around to different rooms? But if I don't go around to different rooms, then what do I do? Everything's kind of up in the air, and it's okay to be here, <laughs> but not there. Um, that's not how we want to feel like even the tightrope that we're walking doesn't feel very safe. There's a wonderful wonderful piece of Jesus life that I think speaks to us and to the place that we all seem to be in and to what Jesus calls us to do. <coughs> so let's take a look at it. The Sea of Galilee is notorious for storms. All right? I'm going to give you a little weather channel lesson. All right? The Sea of Galilee is actually below sea level. And on one side is the Mediterranean, you know, wonderful merit, the Mediterranean. Come on, oh, those commercials, you know, the cruises that you can't go on anymore, you know, those. And on the other side, 
is the desert. Iran, Iraq, that dry, dusty, super hot desert. Hot, dry wind, cool, moist wind, below sea level, collision. That's what happens on the Sea of Galilee. This is a picture of Jesus and the guys in the boat, except we, <laughs> if, if I were in Ohio, I wouldn't care much about this picture, but those of us who live here at the shore know that they would not have the sail up during the storm, all right? My friend Ken is a boater. He's looking at it saying, those guys are crazy. They, they, they must be from Ohio. Um, they, they've got the sail up in the midst of the storm. Jesus has just fed the 5,000 people. He's at the peak of his popularity. Everybody's following him. Everybody knows about him. And so immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side, meaning the other side of the Sea of Galilee, while he dismissed the crowd. Don't you love it? Do you think maybe he got sick of them every once in a while? Huh? Look what it says. He made them get, just go. <laughs> Is there a time when, you don't have to answer this. If you're sitting six feet from your loved one, you can answer it. But if you're not maintaining the, 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 the distance, there are times when even the people we love the most, we just get full of them and we need them to just go away. So he makes them get into the boat and sends them on ahead to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Isn't that interesting? It's the peak of his popularity. He's never had more crowds. He's never had more acclaim. He's never had more people interested in him. He's never had more buzz about him throughout the whole country. And what does he do? He goes off by himself to recharge his batteries, to reconnect with God the Father. Here's our first lesson, my sisters and my brothers in Christ. In the midst of all of it, our, our human nature says, work harder, go faster, do more, try more, strive more, give more, work more. And God, our Savior, our Lord, the, our Master, the one whom we are disciples of, the one who we should follow, his example goes off by himself and reconnects with his power source. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Well, that's no good, because there are only two ways to make a boat go. You can row it, or you can sail it. Well, you can't sail it in the storm, and have you ever tried to row in, in rough water, or even in smooth water? <laughs> it's not so good. The Sea of Galilee is seven miles wide. It's there in the, pretty much in the middle. Too far to go back, too far to go forward. They're in trouble. Shortly before dawn, the, 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 the Greek tells us that it was the fourth watch of the night. The Romans divided the, 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 the day and the night into four watches, and the fourth watch of the, of the night is 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. Anything good ever happen 3 a.m. to 6 a.m.? They're out there, and they've been going all night long. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. You would be too. Come on. You know I make fun of the disciples all the time, but I can't make fun of them here. Because if I saw somebody walking across the ocean to, me, to my boat, I'd, you know, I'd be afraid too. Especially at night. I mean, they see him coming out of the dark. It's dark. I mean, it's really dark. They don't have the floodlights. You know, you go on a boat on the ocean at night, the first thing we do is turn on the lights. Not them. They didn't have any lights. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. It's even stronger than that. What Jesus says is, Hey, take courage. I am is here. That's what he says. I am is here. The I am who created everything. The I am who created the universe. The I am who spoke to Moses out of the burning bush. The I am who, who said, Jesus is coming. And the I am 
who would raise him from the dead. He says, I am. The great I am. The eternal one is here. Don't be afraid. It's Jesus' message over and over and over to us. It's the most oft direction from Jesus. Don't be afraid. Well, Peter, (laughs) Peter, mm, he's the one who speaks up and says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. I'm not sure why he did that, but he was trying to verify that it is Jesus, and Jesus calls his bluff and says, come on. I don't think he probably said it that way, but, but I just think of Jesus as saying, okay, come on. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. It's all going so well. He gets out of the boat. He's walking on the water. He's going toward Jesus. But then he takes his eyes off of him and starts to realize, wait a second, I should not be here doing this. And when he saw the wind, isn't that a cool expression? Isn't that interesting? When he saw the wind, you don't see the wind, but you see the storm. You look at the storm. You take your eyes off of Jesus and you put your eyes on the storm. And you give more credit and more power and more worship to the storm than you do to Jesus. And what happens? And beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus said, you got yourself into this. You're the one who kept your eyes off of me. You're the one who looked around tough. Nah, not quite. What's the next word? Immediately. Immediately. Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down, and then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, You are the Son of God. Fascinating story. One of my favorites in all of Scripture because there's just so much. There's so much richness and so many lessons in this story. But today, I want to talk to you about the lesson of risky obedience. Faith in Jesus Christ requires risky obedience. Why do I call it risky obedience? Because Jesus always calls us to step out in faith. To step, to to move from where we are to where Jesus wants us to be. And the problem with that is that Jesus always calls us to take a step beyond our comfort zone. And we like our comfort zone. I like my comfort zone. 26 years in the hospital, I know what I'm doing. I know everybody, I know every place, I know every shortcut, I know where everybody's serving food. I know when you bring donuts to a unit, I know that you've brought them. I've got my comfort zone, and on Friday, I didn't have my comfort zone. We love our comfort zone, and Jesus says, risky obedience Faith in Christ requires us, at times, to leave that comfort zone. Why is it risky obedience? Why is it leaving our comfort zone? Because that step of faith that Christ calls us to requires us to step beyond where we can see. Jesus doesn't say, okay, here's exactly what's going to happen. Here's exactly where you're going to go. Here's exactly how it's going to work out. So come on. That's not walking in faith. That's not stepping out in faith. It's not faith in Christ. It doesn't require any faith. So Jesus always asks us to take a step beyond our line of sight. And Jesus always calls us to take step one before we can see where step two and three and four and six and eight are going to take us. But when we get there, when we do that, when we step out in faith, when we're willing to leave our comfort zone, when we follow where Christ is leading us, even when we can't see where that is, we find out that Jesus is on the other side of that place we can't see. Jesus is calling us to risky obedience, to love the Lord, and become his disciple. 
and reflect his love. Being a disciple means that you do what the master does, that you say what the master says, that you live the way the master lives, you follow the master. And our master walked in love and spoke in love and cared in love. And so risky obedience requires us to do that because love is risky. We know that. We all understand that. Love makes you vulnerable. Love opens you up more than anything else in life. Ripping your heart open to love people leaves you vulnerable. But Jesus lived exactly that way. Jesus loved exactly that way. And Jesus calls us to be his disciples. Risky obedience, Jesus calls us to risky obedience to to make our priorities his priorities. And they're simple and yet very difficult at the same time. To love God and to love our neighbor. Those are Jesus' priorities. Remember going off by himself? He didn't look for the popularity. He didn't look for the power. He didn't look for the prestige. He didn't look for the money. He didn't look for the earthly kinds of rewards. He looked for connection to God the Father. And the priorities of Jesus need to be our priorities, and they're risky because the world doesn't work that way. It makes us different. We don't like to be different. We like to blend. We like to be the same as everybody around us. We like everybody around us to be the same as us. And Jesus says, no, I want your priorities to be my priorities. To love God and to love your neighbor. Jesus calls us to risky obedience, to listen and to follow his call beyond sight and beyond what we consider to be safety. Because staying where I am seems safer. And being who I am seems safer. And loving only people who are like me seems safer. And staying in my little kind of comfort zone, hermetically sealed bubble, seems safer. But Jesus calls us beyond that. And Jesus calls us to risky obedience, to love others as we love ourselves. I think there was a sermon about that sometime, not too long ago. And especially the ones who aren't like yourself. Because it's easy to love the people who are like us, who look like us and sound like us and talk like us and dress like us and shop where we shop and go to restaurants that we go to. It's easy. But that isn't who Jesus was. It isn't who Jesus is. And it isn't what Jesus calls us to do, too. That's risky. I know it. I understand it. I get it. But that's the call of Jesus, to risky obedience. Because why does Jesus do this? Because he wants to stretch us. He wants to grow us so that we live by faith and not by sight. Jesus wants to grow us and stretch us so that we're not self-directed, but we're Holy Spirit-directed. Over and over and over, people said to Jesus, why are you doing this? You should be doing that. According to earthly priorities, according to earthly standards, according to their understanding of what was safe. Remember when he says he's going to Jerusalem to die, Peter says, not you. You, That's not going to happen to you. You can't do that. And Jesus says, as strong as as anything he ever says to anybody, he says, hey, get behind me. You're listening to that guy and not that guy. Get behind me, Satan. So Jesus wants to stretch us and grow us so that we live by faith. Look at what Paul says, who understands this, because he was transformed. He says, our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all, all the troubles. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary and what is unseen is eternal. First of all, Peter did fine when he fixed his eyes on Jesus. Yes, he did great. As long as he kept his eyes on Jesus, the fact that he was walking on the water and the fact that he was out of the boat and the fact that the storm was raging all around him, that didn't make any difference because he kept his eyes fixed on Jesus. 
But when he took his eyes off Jesus and he saw the wind, that's when it all came crashing down. But that's when Jesus immediately reached out his hand and saved him. So Paul says, hey, we've got trouble, absolutely. Jesus never says we won't have trouble. My favorite Bible verse is John 16, where Jesus says, in this world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. We know how it ends. We know who wins. And we have the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. So he says, we've got we've to step out of our comfort zone of what we can see and be willing to take that step of risky obedience to what we can't see because what we can see is temporary. And what we can't see is eternal. Why would we get so wound up about things here on earth, so divided, so split, so angry, so so divided and and segmented over things that are all going to go away when we all can keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, where we're going to go forever. The things we can't see are eternal. So let's, let's look at a different definition of safety, shall we? It would have seemed to the other disciples, what do you think they thought when Peter got out of the boat? Come on, what do you think? What an idiot. Here he goes again. But you know what happened? Do you know what they found out? That the safest place to be was out of the boat. Because that's where Jesus is. So in this time of trouble, in this time of things turned upside down, in this time of life being different than it's ever been before, Look for safety in the presence and the power and the love of Jesus. Look for safety and be willing to step outside the boat of your comfort zone and keep your eyes fixed on Jesus and understand and experience that risky obedience isn't risky at all. When God called me to seminary, we had just finished a brand new edition on our house. (laughs) In fact, I'm finishing it as I'm understanding I'm going to sell it. Ever been there? But our new edition had the first fireplace that my wife and I had ever had. She grew up wanting a fireplace and her parents never put one in their house. And I grew up with, with a house that my parents said, that's where the fireplace goes. Because it was a kit house, it was a planned house. It was all pre-cut and delivered and like Ikea. And only partially as complicated. <laughs> and we both said, this is our first fireplace. And, and it was during those wonderful years where the kids go to bed before you do. Now I'm back to those, I, I, I'm, I, I'm gone now, I've I've been going to bed before my children for a long time now, but we'd put them to bed and we'd lie down on the floor in front of the fireplace and talk about what we would miss about New Jersey and what we wouldn't miss about New Jersey because we were going to Kentucky where we had never been before, literally never been there. And one of the things that we agreed is that we would really miss our fireplace, that it really was not fair to God to call us away from our brand new fireplace. And when we got to Kentucky, we went one weekend to find a house. Just, we, we didn't have a place to live. And we thought, well, we're going, in, uh, we're going in July and it's May. We probably ought to go out and find a place to live because, and that was complicated because neither of us had a job either out there. So, the seminary owned a house that w- had belonged to a professor and, and he had left and they wanted him to leave so they said, we'll buy your house and so you can just go. <laughs> so 
It had sat empty for a year, and friends of ours picked us up at the airport and showed us this house, and we fell in love with it right away and, and bought it, and it has two fireplaces. Two. When we said yes to go, we didn't know that. When we got in the plane to fly to Kentucky, we didn't know that. Sometimes, on the other side of the step of faith that God asks you to take, beyond what you can see, even though it sounds risky, and even though it sounds more dangerous than staying in the boat, God has something special for you. On the other side, of risky obedience. So what are you doing that requires some risky obedience? If there isn't anything, then you have a choice. You can stay where you are. You can go and take that step of risky obedience. If you take the risky obedience, you can find what Jesus has in store for you. And if you stay, you can wonder for the rest of your life what God would have done. Risky obedience, it's the safest place to be because it's where Jesus is. Amen. On the night that Jesus gave himself up for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, Jesus also took the cup. He said, This cup is the sign of the new covenant, sealed by the shedding of my blood for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. For every time that you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again. And so with thanksgiving as the gathered body of Christ, let us come and share the sacrament of communion. Some words of instruction. Um, as you come forward, you can just grab a piece of bread here, just being careful to grab the one piece of bread um, that you will take for your communion. Um, and then you can grab the cup and, and drink the cup while you're up here. It might take a little bit longer for us, but we have uh, low numbers. So, and you can just drop the cup in the baskets that are here on either side. Let us come and celebrate communion together. is 
Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, thank you for sharing the blood and body of Jesus with us. Thank you that you invite us to the table. Lord, we're not worthy, but that's not who you are. That's not what you are. That the blood of Jesus cleanses us from our sins. The, the presence of Jesus and the Holy Spirit living on us makes us worthy to come and share with all the saints around the table. So Lord, thank you for your presence and power with us in this life. And thank you for your invitation to join you at the table that never ends. Lord, we pray for our sisters and brothers, wherever they are, around the world who are suffering, those whose businesses are impacted by this virus, those whose health is, is compromised, those who are afraid, those who actually have the virus, Lord, those who are developing the, the testing, those who work in hospitals and nursing homes and care facilities, who don't have the luxury of staying away. Lord, help us to be the people of God. Help us to set an example for the rest of the world by loving and caring and reaching out. Thank you for our church and for all the steps that they've taken to care for the safety of, of our members and friends. And Lord, thank you for the food pantry and the continued ministry that they have. Lord, for all those whose lives have been turned upside down. Lord, we know that peace comes from knowing you, the peace that goes beyond human understanding. So send your peace to cover over our world, our country, our community, our family. And let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts and let your miracle working power be a part of everything that we say and do. Lord, for those who are sick today, we pray your comfort and your healing. For those who are caring for them, we pray your safety and your protection. For those who are worried and frightful, Lord, just give them, give them presence and give them peace, give them comfort, security. And Lord, help us to live as those who are prepared for anything, because we follow the risen Christ who lives and sits at the right hand of God and prays for us. And as our Lord has prayed for us and taught us, so now let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 525, Here I Am, Lord.
before the benediction, I want to remind you that we do have a congregational meeting at 1030 today. Um, we're, we're trying to get a quorum and uh, do the, uh, the business of the church. We're required to have that meeting once a year. So if you can come back for a, a brief uh, time, please do. The Lord watch over you as your days increase. Bless and guide you wherever you may be. Strengthen you when you stand. Comfort you when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise you up if you fall. And finally, in your hearts, may the peace that passes understanding abide all the days of your life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Not shaking hands. So, go with God.